Hey, welcome to this first time lapse video on the channel. Um, you requested me to do some. I got a number of messages over time, so now you got it. You're going to see me create a game character for, you know, the training series I'm working on. All with Krita. From concept to finish. The total runtime is, um, I think, took me about, you know, a bit less than two hours to achieve. And uh, on the left, you can see the prep work I did before I made this character, which is kind of the hero or uh, one of the two heroes of the game. The uh, young girl, the pig, you can see on the left, is the other one. Before I comment on the time-lapse itself, because this first sketch was somewhat of a draft, I want to say that, yeah, time-lapses, I've been um, reluctant to do them for a little while, because I think it lacks educational value. And uh, watching some on other channels and uh, talking with some people in the community, some of you, changed my views on it. I think it's nice in the end to have some uh, you know, entertaining content from time to time. Something a bit lighter, so it's not always all serious and all. And um, yeah, having the ability to get a more natural tone in the end, it's quite valuable. I think it's uh, the the kind of robotic voice I could have in the past and I that I still have, I'm working on it. It's distracting at times. It doesn't necessarily help. If you look at this character, I made it based on the first sketches that I had made. It's very important. The game art process is iterative in nature. So you are going to make sketches and fail and you are going to throw some away. Um, I'm leaving them all on the screen as I'm, you know, working just so I see what failed when it comes to character proportions. You can see one in the bottom of a pig that's much smaller than the others. Well, that is a failed sketch. And this one as well, you know, I'm not so uh, fond of the proportions. The first one I made for the rabbit, so I scale it down. The smaller the sketch, the least, you know, interesting or uh, the more I want to change it. That's uh, kind of a way for me to give it less importance than some other assets on the screen. And um, the very first character I made for that project, I, I, that I painted on Krita, in Krita, because um, I made some sketches on paper before that, I did a lot of prep work for the training, but the first one was the one on the left, that feels a bit too much like a character from um, an illustration. It, it doesn't feel like a game sprite, and I got that comment from uh, a few teammates um, from other game studios, they were like, it doesn't make me feel like we're going to make a game. And yeah, I want the characters to feel like they could be in a game. That's the, the goal of the training, to teach you the game sprite creation process, but also to make people feel like they are working on an actual game and see the real process, although it's you know, just a training about game art. Uh, that's something that's always challenging, because when you make tutorials about game art, the most important part in game art is the game, is the fact that you're not creating art just in itself, but you are creating it for the purpose and with the constraints that you have creating your game. So it's very hard because uh, lots of artists don't have the technical knowledge, you know, online, hobbyists and all, or the experience of making games and seeing those constraints. So uh, it's hard to explain at times why we use certain proportions. For example, look at the characters on the screen. Uh, from the one on the left, the other ones have very large heads. It's quite common on mobile, but why is it common? Well, it's just because the screens are small and uh, you want some contrast, visually speaking, in terms of the shapes of the characters. So you make the head really big, so you have the expressions visible on screen, you can see the character smile, open his mouth, laugh, whatever. Yeah, so you, you use proportions like these based on the screen type that you have, based on your audience as well. Uh, it tends to make characters that are very cute, especially if you have large eyes. So because of that, you know, you use large heads 
if you are making the game for kids, for example. It's very common to do that. Um, it might also work with adults. You can see chibi characters in um, Japanese games, for example. And uh, if you go to Japan, they love those uh, small, cute characters and all. You see, um, like, stickers in lots of shops and all. I actually bought some for me, like, of small, cute dog characters in one of the Hello Kitty outlets. Some parts are quite boring in the character creation process and quite repetitive and actually time-consuming. You can see one of these right now in the background. I've made the character sketch and I tried to give it a shape, you know, that was uh, interesting, like to simplify the head shape as much as I could. Basically, it's made of one curve that goes from the forehead to the chin and uh, goes back, you know, to the ears. And then you have kind of two flat, um, a bit more flat lines for the top of the head and the back of the head. That's a good way to give the character visual contrast. And then, uh, that's something I do from time to time. It depends on the types of game, uh, type of game assets I'm making as well. That's making the contour of the shapes based on the character's sketch, and then filling it with the fill tool. So that way you get the silhouette from for each and every one of your shapes on a separate layer, and you can use Preserve Alpha and any paintbrush you want to paint the final asset inside of them. And you have them cut, ready, or cut out animation. You can't really export the assets easily from Krita right now to do that, but with the upcoming uh, Python scripting, you know, that's that should be quite easy to do. So I not always use different layers. For example, the head and the ears are all in the same layer. But when you are animating the character for the game in a program like Spine or Blender or anything like that, you're going to separate the ears and uh, maybe a bit more than that. Sometimes you will split the hands as well. And the reason I don't do that is so I can recolor the body parts more easily. Uh, very often I will just have, you know, the torso with the arms and the hands all in one layer. And that is until I find the right colors for the character. You can see me use the hue saturation filter. And one problem when you separate everything from the very start on different layers is that you have to apply that new base color on every layer. And also, I don't use a fully traditional process on the character for that reason as well. It's common for um, clients, for example, to ask you to recolor the character. And because of that, you want to start with the right base color. A lot of concept artists use that method where they make the um, illustration grayscale and they then color it on another layer with the color blending mode and a bit of overlay, multiply. You know, it's quite common in illustration. Where it's also easier to do without wasting time. When you're making game sprites and you have lots of different body parts, you're going to waste a lot more time if you use a, a method like this. That's one thing I'm thinking of, you know, when uh, Python scripting will be available. I'd, Krita has this very powerful transform tool where if you transform a group, Krita will recursively transform all of the layers inside of the group. But I'd like to see if that'd be possible to do with the filters as well, to just, uh, you know, you select multiple layers, and you want to recolor them, and Krita basically gives you a preview, and when you press OK, it just does the same thing as the transform tool. It applies it to each and every layer. I think that should be feasible, you know, with, uh, with Python. Um, it's worth taking a look at, because it's quite common for game artists to do that when you make 2D sprites. Often want to recolor parts as you go, as far as the process is concerned, well, you can see me, once I have the various parts and the eyes and, and the facial expression, basically, I start painting just inside of the skin layer. Uh, I think I, yeah, I split it on another layer with Alpha Inherit, which is a, a way to do that a, a bit more non-destructively. And I just paint in a traditional way. You know, I 
change my color on the color picker and I use lots of brush strokes. And that's something I'm trying to convey in the training. Uh, the fact that if you want to get that traditional look or style, you have to use a traditional method. You can't really do it um, um, with filters or with special tricks. There's no magic brush that's going to do all of the work for you. And that's why it can take quite a bit of time. But you know, when you're looking at the character right now, it's almost, you know, almost half of the creation time was dedicated to just making the sketch and then making the uh, body parts, splitting them up in the document. And now we're looking at the, yeah, roughly the second half where I'm just going to shade and then refine the character. As far as picking the colors is concerned, I think that's a uh, question that comes back often. You know, for skins, it's quite simple. I try to go with something that's along beige, pink, orange. Um, in general, skin tones tend to be a lot, like the, the base of it, tend to be a lot in shades of oranges with varying um, intensity, saturation, brightness. Even people with dark skin are actually in shades of oranges quite often. You know, it's it's not just brown skin. It, it, there's a lot if you um, color pick on a photo and if you observe very closely, you know, you, you have some orange in there, uh, which makes the color really rich. And you just have to um, try, experiment with the those shades and ask for feedback from other people. Because um, it took me quite a bit of time, I think, you know, uh, I, I'm self-taught for, for the most part. And um, at first I just picked terrible colors. That's something, uh, uh, if you don't have traditional training, uh, if you have do no traditional painting, and I work digitally almost from the very start, you tend to not learn to work with colors as well as a traditional painter. Then, as far as the shadow colors are concerned, it's quite simple. You know, you just nudge on the uh, hue ring a little bit and you lower the um, brightness of the color and maybe change the um, saturation a little bit. And that's it. That's this technique that we call hue shifting. I made a tutorial for it in the past on the channel, so you, you can check this one out. Um, the eyes are very important for a character. That's a piece of advice I got very early on because I had this tendency to make characters just with, um, you know, no eyes and no mouth, for example. And uh, a game artist who'd been, who's been working in the industry for a long time told me, uh, basically, you know, you want to add that to your characters just for the sake of uh, helping the player relate to them a bit more. Yeah, it gives a lot of expressivity. You can see that uh, on this one character, um, even though like both eyes are looking in different directions. But that's another story. I'm going to fix it around the end of the process. While I was working on it, honestly, yeah, I didn't see that. Um, but I think it, it just, the problem appeared because I started painting inside of the eye. And it was just that large black blob that was not so much of a problem. For me, it's often hard to find what to say when commenting like that. The process itself, there are lots of things involved, but a lot of them tend to be specific to the character and to boil down to the character's backstory. For example, uh, I made a scarf for a few reasons. First of all, he's meant to be a kind of a kid, but that a, a wannabe hero, someone who wants to be strong and impress girls. That's part of the character's story. And because of that, I wanted to have, you know, very simple clothing because these are kids and uh, they don't care so much about fashion. But at the same time, you need something that makes him look a bit like a superhero and uh, something that's not a cape because I wanted something that we can find in our world, you know, something that feels a bit modern and believable. So a scarf is something very common that can, you know, fly a bit behind you when you start uh, running and all. 
and to justify the fact that the character uses a scarf in this environment that looks warm enough, well, I uh, chose to have nothing on his torso. At first I wanted to have pants with braces and some kind of shirt, but yeah, having just nothing makes him, um, you know, that justifies wearing a scarf which is probably quite warm in this type of environment. And uh, his friend, Peggy, uh, the, the big character, on the left side, she's, um, yeah, she's wearing a bandana to give her a bit of that, you know, bandit-like uh, style. Uh, maybe we can talk a bit about uh, painting the eyes. I think that's quite interesting. It takes quite a bit of time to make the eye look believable and um, natural. You can see you need some shadow around the edges where the, uh, you know, the eyeball itself falls inside of your eyelids. It's quite important that really dark parts around the edges makes the eye pop. It, it's quite important. And same thing, so you have that uh, dark portion, you know, the... Um, how is it called? How do you call that? Uh, yeah, the dark part of the eye. It, it's very dark, but to add extra contrast around it, you want to um, add brightness to, to the rest, to the brown of the character. And a bit... you want to make it a bit brighter at the bottom, because at the top you're under the eyebrow, you're a bit closer to that, and you tend to have a little more shadow in there. So as a game artist you can exaggerate that, which makes the eye really shine. And at the end of the process, I will make the eye very dark again. The character has one problem that's quite important right now. Um, I'm trying to add a bit of volume to it, but honestly it's making it look a bit weird. The shape of the head is so simple and the shading is getting a bit more complex. It doesn't work really well with one another. The simplified shape makes it harder to give the character a lot of form. So around the end I'm going to do just the same thing I did with the big character. I will uh, simplify the shading, flatten it a bit more and um, try to stick to that uh, eventually. Um, However, on the clothing, I can give a bit more volume, like make the scarf, for example, look a lot more rounded, and that's something that will happen around the end of the process. I jumped ahead just a little bit to show you the uh, end of the process where I fix the eye and all. Um, one thing I want you to notice, which is very common with game sprites, is to have that kind of outline around the character. Even with that painterly style, it's quite exaggerated on the face, but if you look at the scarf, for example, it's very subtle. It is some kind of outline, but it stays somewhat true to what happens in nature. Uh, the fact that as objects turn into space away from light, they just get darker, and you tend to have, you know, very thin edges that pop in reality, with um, that effect, the fact that you have shadows that accumulates around the edges, either shadows or highlights, for example, when the light is coming from behind the object. But that that's not the case with the character. The light is mostly coming from the top. Fixing the eye was quite simple. You know, I just uh, used the free transform tool and uh, with a selection, and that's one of the strengths I was talking about uh, in Krita, where you can Select a group, you make a selection, you transform uh, something and all of the layers get transformed. And I've never seen it in any other program, you know, uh, although it's really powerful. Uh, it's something I use on almost every game sprite because it allows me to work non-destructively to make a lot of layers, but uh, I have the option to move parts around still. And um, yeah, we're looking more at the polishing phase. Um, it's not exactly polishing, I would call that refining the character still, but it's kind of done, you know, uh, nitpicking. And um, yeah, here we are. That's the end of the process. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to leave a like. It makes a uh, big difference for the channel. 
And uh, yeah, tell me what you thought, how I can improve the time lapses. If you want to see more, you know, those kinds of things, what you'd like to see and all. Um, the more, you know, feedback you give me, you know, the, the better I can make the videos. The character itself comes from the Game Out Quest training and I'm leaving you a link in the description. It's in early access right now and it's shaping up. Um, so yeah, if you want to check it out, you know, it's in the video description. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Bye bye.